How do you get guitars to stand out in a metal mix? That's not the beginning of a joke. Today we're going to go over 8 simple tricks that I use all the time to get my guitars to stand out. So let's start off, if any of that interests you, let's dive right in. Metal and gent music is quite difficult to get the guitars to stand out because guitars, vocals, synths, and cymbals are all sitting roughly in the same frequency range, as well as the drums, bass, and guitars being percussive. So there's kind of no pocket, we have to make our own pockets. So the first tip is starting with recording, and we want to make sure that the source material is tight and in tune. So obviously, it would be to record them properly, in tune, and to get zero or as little string noise as possible. And it's tough because we're all guitar players, we want to feel like we've done something, we want to feel like we can play the guitar part through perfectly. And realistically, with metal music, it's not possible, not necessarily even because of our playing ability, but because the amount of distortion and the amount of tones that come through, there's a lot of string noise. The little tiny bit of a string ringing out, because we're adding distortion, you'll hear it. So we want to make sure that we record them properly. So if you haven't seen it, check out the episode right here where I go over how the professionals record music. I've recorded two albums with Bill Putney and his assistant Randy LaBeouf. Randy does his own stuff now. The North Lane Alien album, I tracked bass on it, and I also was there for the guitar tracking, period. So I see how they record it and how everybody records in the professional realm. It's unfortunately like this, and it's the only way to really get them tight. So tip number two would be to layer and quad your guitars on the important parts or just overall. In typical metal music, you do a left take and a right take for the stereo width of your rhythm guitars. And if you want them to sound even better, you'll make an additional left and right. That way you have quadded guitars. And this way you get your sick rhythm tone from your first two, and then your quad guitars are a little bit lower in the mix, but they're filling out whatever frequencies you're missing. It's a little bit different than copying and pasting your rhythm guitars and adding a different amp tone. It's different because you're not getting the additional take, and that fills it out in a different way that amp tones can't, unfortunately. So in the other episodes where I've mentioned quadding guitars, a lot of the times when I'm recording albums that I really care about, I will quad guitars for the entire thing, and then when the chorus comes or when the biggest breakdown comes, I will do an additional left and right, so six layers of guitars, just to make them really stand out. So when I'm recording guitars, I don't just like do a left and right and then finish the whole song and then go back and do quads. I do four takes of everything right at the time so that it's all just done right away. So number three is to choose the right amp or the right cab for the job. This tip came about because I put out a recent poll asking what everybody's issues with guitars are. I do polls so that I can figure out what kind of content I'm gonna make. Feel free to leave a comment in there or to actually like answer whatever your question or your concern is. I do it for a reason. It's not, it's not just a pull for a pull. It's a pull to figure out what I should do for next episode. This is slightly a loaded question because the right amp doesn't necessarily mean the right amp. It kind of means the right cab combination. There was a video a while ago that I saw. I think it was Kohler that made the video. I'll take it down below when I find it. And the whole video was basically the cab makes more of a difference than the amp. And he went through a bunch of amps that he was able to get the same tone from but the cabs make a drastic difference. Let me just put my headphones on. So let me show you this part from the last couple episodes. I'll show you the first version and the second version. The only difference between them is the cab that I'm using. I'll show you them soloed real quick so you can really hear the difference. So comparing the two, one of them is a bit more high-endy and a little bit less defined, and the other one is more defined in the notes, but less high-endy. So for chugs, for instance, you would probably want the more high-endy one, and for a notey, riffy section, you'd probably want the one that's more note-defined. And that's how I go about getting an amp tone. For me, once I find like the, the right amp setting is when I go into the cab. I don't usually go cab first and then amp. It's a lot of back and forth, but I just find this is the least back and forth if I get the amp right and then I f with the cab. And that goes from the exact same amp settings. The notes literally jump out. So tip number four, each amp will have slightly different names for it. On the 5150, it's called the post gain, and it's basically just the volume of the amp. And I did a full episode on this. If you, I'm not gonna go into the full details of it, but if you wanna check it out and you haven't seen it yet, it's gonna be right here. This tip is basically just playing with the volume, and by pushing the volume louder, you're pushing the tubes, and the tubes will saturate more and you'll get more of the mid-range and more of the note definition, which isn't always the vibe. Sometimes when you are playing chuggy parts back, 
you actually want it to be a little bit more scooped and I find that having a lower post gain somewhere around here say as opposed to up here quite a bit more of the chuggy sit the chuggy bit and it sounds more scooped so check out the whole episode to learn more so number five is the last video that I came out with, which if you haven't seen, check it out. It's basically duplicating your main rhythm tones and making an amp version with no cab on it. Huge difference. So yeah, if you haven't seen the whole video, check it out right here. I go more in depth into the whole technique and what's going on there. Another thing that I mentioned, but I didn't put into illustration there, say that no cab thing was too much for you. Let's experiment with a different kind of amp. So for this section, since my guitar is sound like this, they're cool and they're cutty and they've got some of that mid range, but I want more, even more of the presence and the cut without relying on that amp too much. So I will use this no cab version, but I'll put a nameless on these, as you can see here. And it's mostly going to be like my cut. And then these ones sound like this. So a lot more scooped. So now that we have the nameless on, filling out the sound with more of the high end chug. First, make sure that we're in phase. I'm just going to put any plugin that has a phase flip option on it. So it sounds more scooped, flipped phase, but you're losing out a lot of tone. Like you can hear something sounds like there's like a phaser pedal on it. It's a bit weird. So I'm just going to keep it phase off because it sounds better. It sounds more full. It sounds more chunky. And you especially notice it when it's turned off. When it's initially added, it doesn't sound like an extreme, extreme difference. When you turn it off, you're like, that sounds really weak. I personally like the no cab variant more than I like this. So I'm gonna stick with the no cab. So the next one is the frequencies to cut and boost so that they sit well in the mix. And I really like Jordan from Hardcore Music Studio. He has a few episodes where there's like cheat sheets and like magic frequencies for guitar, kick, bass, whatever. I would say check out his videos, they're really good. I do more boosting than I do cutting. So let's look at this, my SSL, I'm boosting a little bit of everything and I'm boosting a little bit of like my, whatever that is, 240 Hertz for low end, boosting a little bit of 800, boosting a little bit of 1.8 or 2K and then boosting a little bit of high end. I learned this trick from a Will Putney nail the mix where he likes to boost a little bit of like high end in his guitars and I really like that. So I took it. And then I have a secondary EQ here, which is again, boosting a little bit of high end, but also cutting it from that point. I really like pull text because you can boost from say here, but then cut at the same frequency. And likewise for the low end, boost, but cut. So I'm doing both those things. I'm boosting a little bit of 100 Hertz, but also cutting from 100 Hertz, boosting a little bit of 10,000 Hertz, but also cutting a little bit of 10,000 Hertz. And then boosting 1.5K a little bit, cutting a bit of 500 hertz just to get rid of a little bit of that low end. And basically when I'm cutting my mids, I'm looking for where the bass starts to come out more, but doesn't affect the tone and doesn't make the guitars too thin. So it's odd because you can notice around say 800 hertz when I'm cutting, you'll hear more of the string attack of the bass in the middle there. And same thing as when I'm cutting around 300 hertz, but you lose too much of the guitar tone. And since the guitars are more important to me than the bass, I'm going to cut where it sounds like it's helping the overall mix. Everything you're doing in mixing is to make sure that the whole song is being accounted for, not just one instrument. There I can hear the bass coming through a lot, but the guitars are getting too affected. 
And I noticed that the bass chug comes through a little bit more as well when I cut from 400 hertz, but the guitars don't sound like they're really missing out. So I'm going to go with that because it helps the overall mix. And I feel like I can hear the drums a little bit better too. <laughs> Like I can hear the presence of the kick a lot more and the snare and because like the mid range of the kick is around there and the a lot of like the tone of the snare is around there, it makes sense to cut the guitars and to do a decent job where you're not cutting too much and losing the guitars and making them sound thin. If there's like an annoying frequency, usually between like 2.8 to 4,000 Hertz is like an annoying frequency. I'm not really hearing it right now. Just keep in mind that if you're hearing like a little like a ring, you solo it. I like Fab Filter because you can listen to just that frequency. But yeah, for more information, check out Jordan's videos. I'll link the specific guitar one in the description down below. So this next trick, number seven, is a multiband trick. And it's such an important trick that they've made a plugin that only does this. So I use this plugin called Trackspacer. You choose your frequency range and you send whatever trigger you want. So for me, I'm sending my snares to this plugin. So every time that my snare goes off, my guitars duck at that frequency. And they're ducking, you can see I have at 5.2. 8%. Let me go to further so you can hear it. And for this specific song, the snare cutting the guitars out at 156 to 1 1.4. Let's go to the extreme so you can hear what it's doing. And then once I mute it, The snare sounds like it's way further back in the mix than it should be. For me, at 9.5% here, I don't hear it cutting into the guitars, but I hear the snare coming out a bit more. So Future Brendan here, editing this video, forgot to mention that if you don't have this track spacer plugin, that's totally cool. You can do it with a bunch of different other plugins. I'm gonna do a little example of using Pro MB by FabFilter. Basically what you're gonna do is first off, enable and Annalise, you go into your sidechain section, and then I'm gonna add the snare here, and then I click, my little frequency wherever I'm going to put it. I'm going to put it roughly in the same spot. So 1.8 to say 200. And then we go to expert mode here, exterior. And then that way it's sending all the snare information to the guitars. There's no like percentage in it. So I'm just going to go like minus 1.8 dB say. And then let's listen to this. <laughs> So it's doing the same thing every time the snare happens, it's dipping down. Another way to do it. Do whatever you want. I like more of the fatness of the snare coming out and dipping the guitars. So I cut from 150, but I know it's really popular to kind of start the cut from like 1.38 to three hertz or whatever. <laughs> So I do the same technique with the bass, except my kick is side chaining the bass so that every time the kick goes off, my low end gets cut from 63 Hertz. I used to use my bass for most of my sub frequencies and let the kick be more of the mid range punch. But I found that I do a lot of cutting and when I would remove the guitars and the bass and it would just be drums, it would sound way thinner. So recently, I guess within the past two years, I started switching so that my kick drum is actually my sub frequency and my bass is more of the low end foundation or the low mids. And you don't really hear this because it's such a sub frequency that it's really, if you have a sub in your room or you have like speakers that you can really hear the low end, you'll notice more of a difference, but it's more so that in the mix and in the master, you don't get this insane amount of low end happening and compression happening since compression happens first in the low end. And you can see if I...
It's keeping the percussion from the pick attack of those fast kicks and not getting in the way of the kick drum, which is awesome. In a way, this is helping the drums cut more than the guitars, but since it's helping the drums cut more, there's less compression happening on your mix bus and your master bus. So in this way, your guitars and your bass get sucked down less when the kick and snare happens. So number eight, we'll be adding auxiliaries and parallel send and returns. And for me, in Ableton is different than Brendan in Pro Tools because here. Well, I don't know why I referred to myself in third person. I've never done that. So in Ableton, they actually cut you off at like 12 cents, which is super annoying because when I'm mixing in Pro Tools, I probably am using like at least eight on my drum bus alone or on my drums alone. And then I have to worry about guitar, bass, synths, and vocals. I noticed that in Pro Tools, my mixes sound like 10 to 15% better than they do in Ableton. Ableton I use for these videos because it's really easy for me to get around. It's a bit quicker than Pro Tools, but Pro Tools doesn't cut you off with send and returns. That's why I don't mix in Ableton. And then I just send all of my rhythm guitars to a parallel. And then for my parallel, I'm compressing it. And it's quite quiet, I'm at minus 15 dB. <laughs> And for my parallels, I used to go with the old technique of like the slow attack, fast release, and that really brings the chugs out. But to me, over time, I noticed that like chugs just come out more anyways, because they're so percussive. So I recently started just going a little bit heavier on the attack, just going to a point where the notes come out a bit more. And basically this is just adding a little bit of volume, yes, but it's also adding a lot more stability and evenness. And guitars themselves don't need a lot of compression because the distortion and the amp tone are compressing them. So I don't like to compress my guitars themselves, but I like to compress the auxiliaries because I can go as quiet or loud as I want with them. And they're basically just like squashing the guitars so they're constant. I'm finding recently that a faster attack and like somewhat slower release work better for me to make sure that the guitars are glued and that when they happen, they don't just happen and come right back as if there's no compression. They kind of just like glue and like slowly are going back and forth like elastic-y. I find that when I go too fast with the attack, they distort in a weird way and I don't like that. And then when I go too fast with the release, they just get, they get let out too quickly and they're, it doesn't sound like it's compressing. It just sounds like it's adding volume. And if that isn't enough, and it usually isn't, to be honest, say the whole song in general sounds like a good volume, but certain parts aren't loud enough, that's when we automate. So say, for instance, I want those harmonics to come through a lot more. I just go through in Ableton, you press A, and it brings up your automation. I'll go into my main or rhythm guitars here, highlight the section that I want, and then just raise them, oh, to click on the volume. And raise them, I'm gonna start with like just one dB. Compared to. That's a huge difference. One dB just makes them pop a bit more and like it sounds wider, but it's actually not wider. And a good rule of thumb is that you don't wanna just go like hard up and hard down. You wanna ramp them slightly. I'm just going to quickly go through and raise the parts that I want to be a little bit louder. I want these chugs specifically to be a little bit louder, just for emphasis. And this stuff makes a big difference in like the song itself. I'm going to go a little bit louder on these chugs too. So that's my foolproof strategy of making sure that guitars stand out in a mix. Those nine tips make a huge difference when working in tandem with one another. And they're a little bit of extra work, but obviously we want the best mix possible, so we're gonna go to that effort. But none of these tips really make a difference unless you have recorded your guitars properly. So if you wanna learn how to record your guitars properly, check out this video right here. If you found any use in this video, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. It really makes a difference in the algorithm. I'm trying to make more of these videos, and if I have more of a reason to make these videos, I'll definitely make more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. See ya.